Welcome, and we are live for our Game On Expert Interviews. I am Jean Berry, and I am your Game Inventor Mentor. And I'm thrilled to introduce today one of my friends that I've known actually for quite some time and finally convinced her <laughs> to come on and talk to you. So I would love for you to meet Courtney Burton. Courtney had nearly 30 years of experience in retail. She managed both sides of the retail sales as a buyer and as brand management and as a broker manufactured rep selling exclusively to Target. And so she has the experience in all sides of handling retail sales and has come to learn exactly what it takes to actually be successful in that kind of venue. When she left her corporate job, she chose to go into the creative side of the world and became a musicpreneur. She's now a very successful jazz singer with her own production company as well, well not production, but event production company, as well as her own um, band and uh, solo singing career. So she is killing it on both sides of the equation, both creative and corporate. And so I'm so thrilled to introduce you to Courtney Burton. Welcome. So glad you're oh, here, Courtney. Thank you so much, Jean. And it is an honor and privilege to be able to talk to your community and always a thrill to see you and do whatever I can to help you and those who follow you with their success. Well, beautiful. Thank you so much. And thank you for your generosity with your time today. And we have a couple people popping on today. Hey, Joanne. Hey, Beth. So glad that you popped in. If you're coming to watch us live, go ahead and let us know that you are here. If you have questions along the way, absolutely pop them in there. We're going to have lots of fun conversation, both on the creative side and on the business side. And um, I think it's going to be really amazing. So <laughs> I'm absolutely. looking forward to that. Absolutely. Okay. So I have a question for you. Actually, I have a lot of questions for you, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of, um, so first of all, actually, before we go into that, I gave a little interview, but our introduction, can you tell us a little bit about you and from your point of view? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I started my creative career, the singing, as a lark, and people find this story fairly fascinating, so that's why I'm going to share it. I did not think I had a very nice voice because I always had a low voice. I'm a true alto, and in high school, if you remember the dynamics were, you know, only sopranos had good voices, and I bought into that story. So I never sang. I was singing in the shower freshman year of college at the beginning of the school year, and somebody said, hey, that sounds really good. We could use some help at uh, Mass. Would you come and be part of the group that's singing at Mass tonight? I'm like, me? Sure. And that is what started it. And then I allowed life to take over after college, and I took a 15-year hiatus from singing after singing very steadily for four years uh, because my need for security, and that's what you were supposed to do. You come out of school, you get a job, you do all those corporate things. And 15 years into my corporate career, again, fate. I had mentioned that I used to sing at weddings and somebody told somebody else in the organization I was working at and they said, hey, the big band I play with has a spot for vocalists. Would you audition? And I'm like, me? Really? And I've been the vocalist with Beasley's big band for over 20 years since. It Was it fun? Was it rough at the beginning? Yes, it was rough. It was horrible. 15 years of not singing. But you know, when it's your passion and you acknowledge your talent, little extra hard work comes through. And so here I am at the end of that career saying, now's my time to really exercise those creative juices in a different way. And I'm finding a couple of expressions to do that. And so that's why I'm here and to impart some of that to you and encourage you guys to live your lives in a way that both sides of you are really met and honored. Your creative expression and that business side. Beautiful, beautiful. And so I'm curious if anyone here is watching has ever felt like that, <laughs> been on the corporate side, but had this creative piece of you that was calling. I certainly had a very similar story, <laughs> you know, high school artist and then nothing, <laughs> like nothing exactly. for a really long time. Um, so th 
Thank you so much for sharing that story. Um, if, you, if you feel like you have been in that kind of way or, or if you're even transitioning now or even thinking about adding some creativity to your world, we would love to hear from you um, whether that would be something that you can relate to. So thanks for that. And yeah, of course, we're getting yeses, of course, naturally. Of course. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> where that lives. Um, so I'm, let's, let's, I, we talked a little bit about music and, and we're going to come back to that because sure. <laughs> it's about this head heart thing, right? We're going to keep bouncing yes. back and forth and back and forth. So I want to talk to you a little bit about retail because you started out as a buyer at Target. Yes. Ultimately, at the end of your career, then was selling as a selling. broker to Target. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and so I find that really amazing. And so what would you say is, is kind of the process for buying and selling a Target? Like, how does that work? The process is um, fairly straightforward. It's, this process itself is somewhat simple, but it's not easy. That's the best way to put it. So it's a long process. Most people don't realize that it is the process itself for buyers to make their choices about what ends up on the shelf takes about a year to a year and a half. So part of being successful as someone who wants their product on a retail shelf is understanding the timing that the buyers or merchants are working with. There are certain things they look for and people who I nurtured along the way as a buyer, what I found was the most exciting for me is if they were solving a problem that I had that would help me be financially successful as a buyer. Because at the end of the day, one needs to understand their motivation is about profit, profitable sales to meet their targets. So no pun intended, every pun intended. Um, <laughs> so if you can meet, if you help them in a way that makes their shelf more profitable and you are easy to work with and you understand their processes, that's, those are the big puts and takes, but it really is about a year and a half long process to even be considered before you see it on the shelf. Yeah, so if I have a product though that I'm thinking, oh, this is really cool. This is so aligned with Target. I love Target and you know, like it should mm -hmm. be in Target or Walmart or any one of those other big boxes. Any of those. Right. Can I just pick up the phone and call them? <laughs> You're probably not going to get an answer. You could, <laughs> but more than likely, no. There's it's one of the things that I tell people before they enter into the retail space is to understand a few things. One, why you're doing it. Are you creating a, well, here's a question for the group. Are you creating a business and an, a company with the product that you have, or are you creating merch? Ooh. Both are completely valid options. And they have different reasons for being in a retail space and in different retail spaces. Okay, so explain, explain. <laughs> what the difference is between a product and merch. And merch. So if you think about merch, musicians have it, um, a lot of artists do it, where it's print to go, it's online, and it's really about, it's, it's access for their fans to take a piece of that, that artist that they really love and want to support with them. Right? It's your favorite mug from somebody or the face mask that Jean's now offering. It's those kind of things. And yes, you have a great t-shirt design that you've got out there. You're like, oh, this would be perfect in a Target. They can create a t-shirt line way faster and way cheaper than you'll ever be able to because of scale. Now, if you're a company that has a following that's existing already of some size, that there's a story behind it because as Simon Simic says people don't they don't buy what you do because they do, they don't buy what you do just because of what it is they buy why you do it so understanding that why and being able to say that in your branding message and being true to that that's something that would get a retailer's attention like okay this is unique in the marketplace and yes, while it might be similar merchandise, like it's a t-shirt, it's a t-shirt, but if there's a loyal following for it already and has a very specific message, that might get their attention. So it's all about your why. That's the difference. That is fascinating. <laughs> that is incredibly fascinating because you don't think about this kind of, you know, I'm going to invent a really cool widget and it's going to, you know, go big and it's going to be the big 
stores and then you know it's going to get big we really don't necessarily go back to well what's the story <laughs> what's the story and uh, if you Okay. Yeah, so I'm wondering if you can share like an example of that. Like, what does yes. that look like? Um, there's a couple of lines. There's one. There's one line in particular that comes to mind that I helped um, when I was a broker, helped get into Target, and there was a series of synchronicities that got them there. But at that time, this was a personal. It's a, actually it's a skincare line in the natural space so they were fairly early in the trend of somebody like a Target having natural products on their shelves. Target was open to deal, working with smaller companies because you got to remember they're in the world of P&G and those big guys so it takes a little different TLC to handle a smaller company and the brand proposition for this company was very simple five ingredients or less. Simple story. The founder was um, actually trained as a nutritionist who had nutritional um, training had skin issues and went into her kitchen and developed skin care for herself she started the line to show people how to do DIY and they started selling these at little store you know little fairs and festivals in their community and all the jars were out of like kitchen jars so they were spice jars or little jam jars lovely little story and people are like that's nice it's a fun to know but can you make it for me that's how they started and she was at the right place at the right time with a very simple to understand message at the retail shelf pure ingredients five or less so but she, <laughs> I've got to suspect then she had to be uh, ready then to make the quantity that target yes. needed which is a whole different proposition a whole different proposition a lot of people don't realize that even a small amount of target stores or any size any any retail of any size is way more than you can probably make in your kitchen and a lot of natural skincare products for example people are making them in their kitchen you have to be able to know how to scale up enough to do that uh, there was another example of a company I worked with. They are vegan. They live a very strong vegan lifestyle. That is the message that comes through on all their their packaging. They make um, skin care, but their claim to fame is natural deodorants. Mm -hmm. So things like they figured out how to use paper tool tool tubes, like you do the push-up bar tool when you were a kid, for their stick deodorant. I mean, it's all very very intentional. They when we got the appointment with um, the Target buyers, Target said, well, how many stores can you take on? And we had already had this discussion. She said, I cannot handle any more than 250 stores. And the buyer was like, oh. But we knew that if they took on more than that, they would not be able to meet Target's expectations. And there's also a financial issue on how do you front, even for 250 stores, what you need on an ongoing basis because you're carrying the dollars for that inventory until after Target sells it for, and then even after so many, well not, I'm sorry, I misspoke. There are terms that you would need to learn in this process and one is called terms and dating. So um, after Target cuts a purchase order, they do not have to pay you or any big retailer for so many days after that PO has been delivered. Delivered. So you're carrying the financial burden for that for a long time. And they knew from their math that 250 stores was what they were comfortable with dealing with over time. It's a good thing to know. It's right. a really good number. Right, so I'm working with a lot of people who are making games and decks and writing books and, yeah. and those kind of things. I know it wasn't necessarily exactly in the niche that you were working with Target, but I suspect it's a, it's the same, just a different buyer, different title. <laughs> Target, exactly. same, same process. Thing. Same process for the most part with any merchant. And what I would suggest if, if people are really serious about the world of going into some type of retail is there's two, two lanes to think about this through. One is you as a human being, you as a person. What's your ultimate goal for your life to look like? Is your product that you're producing, is it, does it speak to who you are and your calling in the world? Values. 
you know, what are your personal values? What, then what would be the values of the organization that you're building to, to put this product out? Um, because at the end of the day, even if it's, you know, is it, is it really the right thing for a big box retailer? And that's what people, we have options right now. There are so many options. I was speaking to a woman earlier this morning, and, you know, she offers coaching in pop-up stores, some of uh, e-commerce, some of these alternatives where they, that lifestyle, what that lifestyle will create might be more suited for you and your bigger goals as a human. Right. Um, right. Or not, but they're all things to explore. And then there's the other side of that is, what, where would your product be the most successful? Where are the people who want your product actually shopping? Where would they assume they'd find it? And that's a little market research you can do amongst your friends, your family, your Facebook communities, or whatever communities you fall in. If you saw this and you liked it, where would you think you could buy it? See, that's a really interesting question. So we have a couple questions coming in here about Target sure. itself. And then um, I, I, I have another follow-up question, but I'll ask these ones first sure. and then we'll get to it. So how, so Beth was is wondering how many Target stores are there? Like how what percentage of stores is 250 like to actually make that request? Yeah, I thought it was it's teeny. It's pretty small. It's pretty small. You have to, I don't know how many they have out right now because I know there's been some closings and things, but assume that you're dealing with close to 2,000 locations. And that's going to give you a little fluff in your numbers. And they order weekly. If you're on this Target shelf, you have to be set up to receive electronically sent weekly purchase orders and the expected turnaround, except for on imports, is basically three to five days. So you have to have inventory ready. It is called just-in-time inventory. Okay, so this is kind of the follow-up to what you were talking about in just a, a few minutes ago then. You'd need to be somewhat established in order for this to roll. And some of those other things you were talking about, like pop-up stores, e-commerce, um, even Kickstarter or um, selling at the farmer's market. <laughs> Lots of good companies have started that way. Um, yoga studios, um, you know, you like this kind of thing is getting a following because is it also true that you need somewhat of a platform? I heard you kind of say that at yes. the beginning that the following of you and that they Target's not going to buy something unless they know it's kind of an established or at least it, it follows a trend. Exactly. They, um, one thing to think about when you go into a retail environment is you are renting real estate from them. If you are on the shelf, that means something else is not in that space because the space is finite. Buyers are typically given goals of how many items or SKUs, as they may call them, they can have on their planogram, excuse me, on the shelf, try not to get too jargony here, at one time. And most of the time, there's a reduction in that number, believe it or not, not an increase, depending on where that category is, if it's slated for growth or not. Oh. So it's all about being very, very, very efficient on the shelf. So if a buyer makes the determination that your product's gonna be on their shelf, they believe that it will perform better than something they took off of their shelf. So I hear that there's kind of many layers into this. So the first thing is I have this amazing product. I have, I have tested in the market. I feel it's on trend. The next thing that I need to do is I need to find a broker who specializes in this niche selling to big boxes. And they may be specific brokers for Target or for Walmart or for exactly. um, Costco or for whoever the, the big box is. Correct. And find one who and who I initially enroll them in why I'm on trend <laughs> and why I have something amazing. And then once Correct. they buy in, then they need to, they plan their times to actually present it then as an appointment to the buyer for that section. And exactly. so it's this multi-moving thing. Yes. Okay. <laughs> it is. And in the middle of all that, you know, there's an education process that happens with uh, people who are making product who've never been in that space. Because there's a lot that you need to be aware of. When you get the information that comes in, you have to be able to 
understand how that can impact your distribution channel, your trade, you know, who's making the product for you, their timing, all those nuances um, that it's not necessarily. A so you as job. the yes, so you as the expert inside of this niche knows all those things and. I remember you telling me a story though about someone who was new in in the market that you actually believed in and took them along and actually to train them like you you were training them and, and building their business how did how did that work out <laughs> like how um, I've done that I was one of those rare people that would take on what I'd call a passion project maybe once a year when I was in the sales world and I also did that a couple of times as a buyer um, I didn't do all the training for them but um, I set them up for success because we thought we knew that that was a company that would um, do well for us if we coddled them um, but on the sales side it is time intense and you have to have people who are willing to listen but they also need to have their filters for what works for them and what doesn't. So I have examples of spending sometimes a year, year and a half with somebody before they're actually ready to get into the cycle of the review cycle, right? So there's getting ready for prom <laughs> and then going to prom. So think of it that way. And sometimes this could, this is sometimes a two, three year conversation before you're like actually planning a wedding. To prom. <laughs> right. It's like planning a wedding. Um, and then there have been other people, right time, right place, they got into the cycle right away. Um, intense learning. So and so this is the ex where experience comes in as someone in the, this business. And so Beth was asking, so do they give you sales estimates of what they think? And I'm hearing you say no. That's what you're training kinda. them to know. Yeah, so kind of. Yes, kind of. <laughs> Target will give you ideas of what uh, most retailers, oh, I'm going to back up. The, the, the level of accuracy that you will get varies quite a bit across retailers based on how well your product fits with their organization, how it can, how well it matches items that they have a lot of history on for that type of item at that retail at that time of year. So there's lots of factors that go into this. Um, I don't know if Target is still I don't know if they still do this, but a lot of times you would get a pieces per store per week number. So that gives you an idea of, it's the great equalizer. How many pieces per store per week they think they're gonna sell with that item. It is up to you to have um, a buffer in there and to be able to pull the levers so that you can ebb and flow that as sales grow, sales decline if you're on ad. Lots of things can change that pattern a little bit. Some categories, seasonal categories, you might get, hey, you make this many, we'll buy them, you're done. You just help us pay for markdowns. That's a whole nother conversation that's probably too big for this conversation right now. But most categories, if they're in a Target store over a course of a year, you're dealing with those orders every week. So a broker or somebody or a wholesaler, depending on there's a couple of different avenues you can take, they may be able to help you balance out those inventories along the way but it's basically up to you to have enough on hand to meet their demand at any one time and being able to know when to pull back if demand changes and it's okay. a very tricky conversation at the beginning sure so so having an insider basically this is what i'm hearing is you you, you have, probably yes. need to have an insider in here who really understands what's going on to, to advise you on how to even step into the space Absolutely, and and I also think educating yourself is critical. It's a whole different language. It does not operate the way the average consumer thinks. If you once you understand how complicated the whole supply chain can be, it's a wonder anything's ever on the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> and and I think that with COVID, we're seeing glimmers of that, where the supply chains are so tight, and that's what I mean by this. You know, literally geared towards Monday a Sunday a purchase order is delivered electronically and it's out the door Wednesday or Thursday and it's in the store the next week and we had these huge spikes toilet paper <laughs> paper towels all those things that you you know that we've right. been struggling with the supply chain is not set up to deal with those kind of things and that's what life is like when you're a new product you have an idea but you don't know got it got it okay so 
Um, if you are watching and you have questions about this, if you have deeper questions, and Courtney actually has an, an amazing um, deal for you at the end, and I'll, I'll share that with you in a minute. But I kind of like to switch gears at this point. So oh, keep sure. typing in your questions. <laughs> keep typing in your questions because um, yes. it came up kind of this idea of, of like planning an event, you know, yes. for going to prom. I'm thinking planning you know, a wedding. <laughs> and actually you've, you've delved into that arena as well, which yes. is, you know, in the music world, you've had to kind of pivot and, and, and move around and see, you know, live events aren't happening really. They've gone to micro weddings, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and different kind of music um, merch, you talked about that, you know, are, do you have a business based around merch? Yeah. Is that something that you can do? You know, there's, there's a whole different mindset, and yet I can see how everything you did in your past career yes. is totally coming in and allowing you to even, like, say, yes, I still have a business. <laughs> yes, exactly. So exactly. tell me about that, and tell me about what you're doing inside the music world and being a creative and still, you know, having these kind of things work for you. Yeah, it's, it is fascinating when you get to look back and see how all the pieces of the puzzle just kind of do fall in place, even though they don't seem like they're going to at all. Um, my approach to music has, is a little different. At first, it was, it's been a hobby for years, and then I realized calling it that and approaching it that way disavowed the talent. Hmm. It disavowed the gift, and it disavowed the gift of those who I make music with. And I also believe that when we engage in our creative selves, that is that creative flow that we can access gets us into creative flow to create our entire life. It's not just about the end product of how your art or your creativity is expressed. It's how you approach your whole life. We forget. We create every moment that we are breathing. We create our lives. And so as a musician, my position was just like any other business. How, where's the space that I think I really want to inhabit? What's my niche? I'm a jazz singer. I love singing the jazz standards. And you're amazing I, at it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jean. But you know, I'm not going to go out there and be a rock and roller. Not what I do. Um, so that already gives me a very narrow lane, but there's something about niching down. It's not about finding a gazillion people, it's finding the right hundred people that like what you do, or two hundred people, or a thousand people that like what you do. Um, and then the approach to the business is, how many musicians do you know think and speak in, here are the services I offer. Most musicians say, hire us, we're great. Um, I'm in a process now of actually reworking websites and thinking where there are service pages as a musician. Because my thinking is right now, no, there aren't events going on. But as um, we are social human beings, there will be a time when we're back together again. And this is the time that I'm using to position myself so we as a group are ready when that happens. But I'm also expanding past that and realize there's a lot of other things that I can do as a musician that offer value. So that includes speaking engagements, workshops on creativity, the hard fought lessons um, that I've learned through music. Um, I've been blessed with some mentors and the, pro the power of mentoring and what that's meant in my life and how that's been an outcropping for people. So that's one thing. Is it private concerts, you know, house parties, smaller venues, flexible instrumentation for the band that I have, Courts in Session, allows that. But even more so, there's this whole aspect of coaching and mentoring. Because as a small business owner, and that's a musicpreneur, as Jean and I have uh, started using the word, I've learned some lessons, <laughs> and I don't want anybody to go through what I've gone through in the last year and a half. <laughs> and I am more than happy to share all of that um, as we watch the world change. And it's all about, you know, my sister did a, a seminar for a group that I'm in, National Concierge Association. How's that for thinking outside the box? A musician who joined a group that supports concierges. Think about that. 
adjunct the people who have That's right, the people who have the insider thing, you know? If they're at exactly. some fine hotel and they're like, okay, we decided to get married today. <laughs> like, exactly. call me a musician. <laughs> call me a musician, exactly. Um, event planners are part of that group as well. Uh, it was about um, self-care through adaptivity and adaptivity as self-care, and it really is the case. We're all about adapting. So it's um, my process lately has been from a, taking a business head, what are all the opportunities I can scope out? Which ones feel the best to who I am and how I want to operate in the world? And how do I put processes in place to have those get launched in the world? Well, exactly, and you know, Beth is actually saying, it, that she used to do marketing operations for retail placement, which is kind of the other side, which is really yes. awesome. You know, the SKUs, the product builds, all those kind of things, which I'm hearing you say actually inside of music. This is about product placement. There is only so much shelf room. <laughs> there is only so much shelf room inside of my business as a creative. You know, what am I going to put front and forward, be front and center? Because I know that people are going to right now in this market, this is what they're looking for. I mean, put the toilet paper right in the front because people are coming Bingo. to get it. And so, Rainy day, umbrellas up front. <laughs> exactly. Put the umbrellas in the front. And so it's that whole thinking on your feet as an entrepreneur or a musicpreneur, a creative entrepreneur who is saying, what is it that we really offer? And we started to talk about this the other day. I thought it was a really cool conversation, which is what is our hearts want us, mm. you know, what are they really calling forward? for us and I think that that's one of the things you said too about going straight into the music and calling yourself I am a musician this is not a hobby yes. this is a business it's a service business that happens to be creative right exactly and using all of our skills and talents that we've gained over our corporate careers <laughs> and mm -hmm. and bringing them into here and saying how do we then you know marry those two together and even in the whole merch selling a music world because you know honestly a lot of musicians I know make a lot of their money from their merch. <laughs> exactly, exactly. A lot of their money from their merch. And, and it all goes back to having a holistic view of you and what you stand for at the end of the day. Yeah. More questions, I hope? Yeah, so, uh, well, I always have more questions, so. <laughs> Maybe from the chat. Um, so. How big then do you need to be to That's a good question. To go into retail? Um, you well, to go into a big box retail. Big box. Yeah, let's 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 yes. distinguish that. Let's, and then and we'll talk about the other side in just a minute, what the options exactly are. What the options are. But to go into a big box retailer, I would say you should be you know, in their world. Five millions, a rounding error. This is where you have the five million dollars is a rounding error. You have to keep this <gasps> stuff in perspective. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, it might be enough to get you noticed. You might have some good buzz, and it might get you enough to get a test. But that's five million at retail, at, at in your sales, which means you have a strong following. I mean, if you're doing, if you've built an online business with five million bucks. It's a pretty nice size following you've got, for sure. But yeah, when you're in the world, oh, retail math is interesting. They don't put the zeros behind things. <laughs> so $100 million, when I was, the math that I was taught was one zero zero decimal zero. That's $100 million. Now, I do have a friend, though, who had a book, a very indie book, that did get in Target. Yep. Absolutely. And um, and so, you know, there is because she was part of a publisher group and they were bringing a whole stack of books in that were in the same kind of genre. It was the what, the, you know, the buyer saying, OK, well, bring me books that are like this. Yep. We like those. And that book was chosen. Mm, and so awesome. um, that, you know, and so it kind of comes into that kind of, you know, batching of things together, you know, like, are, are we all alike? <laughs> yes. And I also think it is, it's it's really good to know what the trends are. Like, where are you on the trend curve and how much noise is, it's, that, it's kind of like SEO, when you're figuring out your search engine words. You want to be in that sweet spot where there's already a market, you're not forging your way through the forest, but 
it's not so saturated you'll get lost. <laughs> well, you know, that's incredibly true. I was working with an SEO and I, I wanted to like game, div, you know, game makers, games for coaches. Like there is no one searching for that. <laughs> Just let it go. Just let yes, it go. The, no one's yes, searching As a jazz that. musician, trust me, I've been down that same road. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's searching for that. So a lot of it's timing on that. But you can also be building your own. Something else that target, target well, any buy, most buyers do in businesses that are more trend forward is they shop little boutique stores. They shop the indie stores. They are looking for who's getting written up by um, editors, depending on what the publication, you know, your, the um, category you're in. They're searching for what's new, and they may watch your business for a year or so to see do you have, are you gaining enough legs to bring people into their doors. Because one of the things you think about big box retailers, they have a lot of stuff that's the same on their shelf, right? Tide's tide, it is what it is. So what can you offer that would bring in a different group of people into their store than they already have? Right, and I think Target is known for that. Target Whereas other stores are, are more going toward this really, they know what's going to sell, so they're only going to sell this name that's brand, it. that's it. Yep, and I would say that um, I've seen Ulta have some openings for that kind of thing. Uh, Sephora is a whole different ballgame, but also um, Bed Bath & Beyond seems to be oh. a little more generous. You know, that's how the As Seen on TV guys get in, that kind of thing. There have been some indie products that have gotten in there and done quite well and the other thing I would have people really start to watch is follow the big boxes make sure you're reading their their um, corporate um, their quarterly earnings because that will give you some ideas on how they're doing and what categories are growing find out if they're offering um, accelerators retail accelerators Target has offered one off and on for the last couple, three years. I don't know if they did one this year because of COVID, but if you go on their website and look for the word accelerator, it might, um, or under vendor accelerator, take a peek at that. Uh, there have been some celebrities that have been offering those. Um, there's a company out there called 12, uh, 20, 30, excuse me, 37 Oaks. I just talked to their founder who I worked with at CVS. And in a lot of ways, she's a, she is an accelerator. She helps people, an incubator, that's a better way to put it. So accelerator or incubator. Use the, type in those words and see what other resources are out there. There's a consortium of those kind of things right here in the Twin Cities. Where cool. there are people the willing Twin to Cities help. of Minnesota, right? <laughs> yes, not the Twin Cities of Texas, correct. <laughs> um, that there is definitely a, um, there are people out there that want to help reach smaller products small companies that are especially women and minor um, people of color owned trying to help them get onto the shelf profitably sure and yeah Joanne's saying this and it can be difficult now to for the little boutiques because a lot of them are closed and so, you know, this is, and yet I know that a lot of the gift marts that sell to the gift stores, they're still running, they're still having yep. virtual events, they're still looking to the next seasons, you know, because like you said, for Target a year and a half out, same thing for, for even boutique stores. They're yep. holding their gift marts well in advance of that. So I'm looking for a gift mart um, specialist and we'll bring them into, you know, to I'll get into the little gift stores. We'll, we'll keep our eye out for that as well. Um, for what it takes to get into some of the gift stores and that kind of thing and certainly there are, I know of yoga shops and locally here in Texas that you can just go right in and say hey I have this cool matching product <laughs> well, you know do you Absolutely. want to put it on your shelf here you know and and they may say yes you know depending on your terms and and how you can both work on it so that could be a fun way but like you said there's the even farmers markets or online boutiques or pop-up shops or all those kind of things are still um, still in planning stages and Absolutely. for a lot of you who are still planning your products and planning your games and decks and that kind of and books you're at the right place <laughs> because that's the time to think and I think that this is the the last thing that I just want to talk to you about is what are you called to do because I think in the end big box retailing or get having it in a market or doing merch because it's aligned with my mission and then we're gonna sell my product or my coaching along with that all of those are callings of the heart. 
and and it's got to be that thing so i want you to talk just for a minute about how you know when you meet someone when they're ah, yes. when they're coming in and they're saying i have this thing i want to sell to target how do you know that this is their calling that's a really good question when i went onto the broker side of uh sales world i being the analytical person I can be was like, okay, I got to figure out the formula. How big is their company? Da, 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 da. And I realized with my passion project partners, that wasn't going to be viable. And it was a series of conversations to find out why they started the business, what they're about, how they see their business forwarding their mission in the world, where they wanted to be long term. And frankly, there was something I started listening to in their voice. And it was, are you ready? I could tell after a while if they were actually ready for the emotional roller coaster they were they wanted to embark on. But it became a knowing between the two. And there's it's hard for me to describe this, but I'd go through a, a conversation of basically almost trying to talk somebody out of it right here's all the things you're talking about that you'll be encountering and if that came back and if they came back and said yep I understand and I still want to move forward there was something in that and I still want to move forward I'm like okay we'll move forward but if I felt any hesitancy or if it was a nice to do in the conversation I would keep probing and saying are you sure are you sure are you sure because it, it I think success in retail or anything comes from being hopeful, knowing where you're headed, and going in eyes wide open. Yeah, stay the and course. And when those three yeah. things come together and you can stay the course, that's when the perseverance comes in to overcome what you don't know, learn from your mistakes, and keep putting one foot in front of the other. And that's how success happens. That's how success happens. Right, following following those prompts, you know, like following that little thing. So, okay, so here's the prompt. <laughs> so, if after listening to all this and you're like, holy shit, or you're like, I'm still in. <laughs> okay, if you're that person who's like, I'm still in, Courtney has generously offered a little bit of her time, one-on-one, -on -one, to have a conversation with you to see if she can offer you some resources or any other support on this journey. So I'm gonna give you the link to that right here. Okay, it's a long link to her Acuity calendar. Um, you can just click on that. It will allow you to book right on her calendar. I, I, I'm just blown away that you have offered such an amazing thing. That is really awesome. I so appreciate you coming and, and speaking Thank with you. us today. And so before, um, we sign off is there any final words of wisdom or something that you know is burning in your head you're thinking you would like to to share with our viewers two things come to mind always be true to your heart now, i believe in your head your heart and your gut will always tell you if the decision's right or not listen to all three and keep checking in and this is why That's I love you. <laughs> this is why I love you. Thank you so much Thank for you, coming. This was delightful. If you want to be with uh, Courtney again, again, the link is, is right there in the feed. You can pop on there. If you want to know um, more about diving into some more support and some of the things that we do inside of extra interviews and some of the amazing people that I actually have on the resource list <laughs> for games and decks and inside of the um, Dreams and Action Master Club. I would love to send you more information about that if that is like you're like, wait, what's the Master Club? How do I get in there? We are a group of people who are truly making cool things get out in the world in beautiful ways and in profitable ways that make our businesses work. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Courtney. Thank you, thanks thank you. you all for watching and we will see you all again. Thanks all. Thank you, Jean.